Hello and welcome everybody. Let's make some curry. So we're gonna be doing a Thai green curry today, which I think can be a little tricky if you don't have the right type of mortar and pestle, which I kind of don't, mine's kind of small. So I've kind of tried to formulate this a little bit to make it as easy as possible for somebody with the type of equipment that I have. So one of the key things I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be doing things in kind of stages in the uh, mortar and pestle there, because if you do everything all at once, the thing about curry paste is that it has a lot of ingredients in it that are really kind of tough and fibrous that you really want to make sure you pulverize. And that can be really tricky when your mortar and pestle is kind of small and everything just kind of starts sloshing around. It can be really difficult to get in there and make sure everything gets pounded down fine enough so that it doesn't get stuck in your teeth later. So the first thing I'm doing here is some spices. I'm just doing some cumin and coriander. I'm gonna grind that up first and then I'm gonna set that aside for now. I'm gonna season to taste later with this but I don't know exactly how much I'm gonna use so I'm just gonna set it to the side. And now we're getting into the kind of tough stuff that I'm gonna do in stages. The first of which is gonna be lemongrass. This is probably the biggest one that you really wanna make sure you pulverize as much as possible because lemongrass that is left in bigger chunks becomes almost inedible. It's really, really tough. You can't chew through it. You really, really wanna make sure you break this down as much as you possibly can. So to make sure I'm able to do that, the first thing I'm gonna do is chop it up really fine. Just makes it easier to give yourself a little bit of a head start there. And I'm gonna put a little pinch of kosher salt in there. The kosher salt kind of helps with abrasiveness uh, in this kind of situation. So it'll help grind things a little bit more and it'll help break them down a little bit easier and a little bit more quickly. So that looks pretty good to me there. I don't really see any big chunks anymore. So that looks good to me. So now I'm gonna add the next couple ingredients, which is gonna be a couple cloves of garlic and then some galangal. Galangal is kind of like ginger. It's pretty similar to ginger, so if you can't find it, you can always substitute ginger for this. It's a little different, but it'll still taste good. Um, but it's a little bit more kind of citrusy than ginger, so it brings a little bit more of a fruity vibe. And the little experience I have with galangal, it does seem to be a bit more fibrous though and tough than ginger. So this is gonna be another one of those ingredients that you're gonna really wanna make sure you pulverize thoroughly uh, before moving on to the next steps. You really wanna focus in on this and make sure you get it into as smooth of a paste as you possibly can. So just like with the lemongrass, I'm gonna chop that up pretty fine just to give myself a head start. So I have to do less work once it goes into the mortar and pestle. And then once again here, I'm gonna add a little pinch of kosher salt just to help with the grinding process to add a little bit of abrasiveness to help break things down. So these three ingredients, the lemongrass, garlic, and galangal, these are the three that I'm probably most concerned about in terms of making sure they're pulverized completely uh, and making sure that there's no big chunks because big chunks of these three are gonna be the ones that throw off the texture the most in the end. By the way, if you put your mortar on like a kitchen towel or something, it'll help kind of mute the pounding sound of it. So it's a little less obnoxious to listen to. All right, so once those three are done, the next thing I'm gonna work on is a shallot. Not quite as critical that I get into a totally fine homogenous paste, but still with, with anything going into this paste, I don't want big chunks of anything. So I'm gonna focus in on every individual aspect of it and make sure it's broken down pretty well. I'm gonna do this whole shallot here. If you want, you could do onion. I would probably do like half an onion if I were doing that. I think that looks good to me there. So I'm gonna scooch that into the bowl where I have all the other stuff on reserve. And now it's time to get into the green stuff. It's a green curry after all, and we haven't done any green stuff, but now we're gonna do the green stuff. And that's gonna start with a bunch of peppers. And this is where I'm gonna start to kind of go off script a little bit. For a traditional Thai green curry, you wanna use Thai peppers. Um, and also I've seen green cayennes used in it. They can be a little tricky to find depending on where you live or where you shop. So I say go with whatever green pepper that you like and has the spice level that you're looking for. So for me today, I'm gonna use two serrano peppers and then three arbol chilies. 
So along with the peppers, I'm gonna do some cilantro stems, just the stems for this. I'll save the leaves for garnish later. Doing probably maybe a couple tablespoons of that. And then here I have some Thai basil. Most of it is gonna be whole leaves that go into the curry at the end, but I'm gonna steal a few of them. Again, maybe a couple tablespoons worth of them and then throw those into the mortar and pestle as well so they can make their way into the paste. Next, I'm gonna do the zest of one lime. Again, this is one of the ingredients that's not super traditional. Normally you would use the zest of something called a kefir lime. Uh, that would be the traditional choice, but again, that can be kind of hard to find, so you can substitute with the zest of a regular lime. So then I'm gonna throw some spices in here. I'm gonna put in a couple pinches of that cumin and coriander that I ground earlier. I'm gonna do some freshly ground white pepper. You can use black pepper if you want. I'm mostly using white pepper to not detract from the color. And then also in that regard, I like to add just a little bit of turmeric. I'm not sure if that's really traditional or not, but I find that just a little bit of turmeric kind of helps with the vibrant green color in the end. So I like to add just a little bit. Fair warning though, I added a little bit too much there. So you really just need a pinch. The dyeing capabilities of turmeric are really, really high. So you only need a tiny, tiny amount of it. So just like with everything else, I'm just gonna smash that up until it's in a relatively even paste and there's no big chunks of anything, no leaves left in there or anything like that. This step I find to be quite a bit easier than the earlier steps because this stuff's not quite as tough and fibrous as the earlier stuff. Uh, so this part goes pretty quick. So once all the green stuff is broken down, I'm gonna reintroduce all the stuff I had on reserve. I wanna pound this all together just to make sure everything's evenly incorporated. I think that's important. And then in addition to that, I'm also gonna add some palm sugar here. Palm sugar comes in these little discs and I'm gonna add about half of one. Palm sugar is kind of interesting. It's really densely packed into these pucks but it's really fine and it has kind of a melt in your mouth quality to it. So it's quite different than something like granulated sugar. But I will say if you can't find it at a store near you, uh, you can go ahead and substitute that with something like turbinado sugar or even brown sugar would be fine. One thing about adding the sugar at this point is that it does draw moisture out of all the other stuff that's in here already. So things tend to get a little splashy at this point. So you may need to clean up your kitchen cabinet doors after this. I tend to get little green splatters just about everywhere when I do this. So once that's all totally broken down, that looks good enough to me there. There's only one more ingredient to add, and for me today, that's gonna be fish sauce. In its most traditional form, there's a fermented shrimp paste that usually gets added to this, but unfortunately I wasn't able to find it. And if I can't find it where I live, chances are other people wouldn't be able to, but you can find fish sauce just about everywhere. And it is different, but it's gonna accomplish kind of the same thing. You need a bunch of bright, green, fresh, citrusy things in there to smell amazing and then you need one stinky thing so whatever that stinky thing may be you can be if you can find the fermented shrimp paste you can do that you can use anchovies you can use fish sauce like i'm doing if you want to keep it vegetarian i would say you could probably use miso um, I think another good option might be like nori, uh, some seaweed, you could do that. But make sure you add something stinky. I promise it's gonna make the end result way better. Without it, it's just gonna end up tasting a little bit more hollow. So that's gonna be it for my curry paste. That's definitely the hardest, most labor intensive part of this whole recipe. So the rest of this is pretty smooth sailing. It's just chopping up a couple veggies and some chicken and you're on your way. Speaking of which, uh, here I have one red bell pepper that I'm gonna julienne into maybe about one and a half inch long strips. And then I have half a can of bamboo shoots here that all I've done is drain these. And then I have four boneless, skinless chicken thighs that I salted a couple hours ago and then let rest uncovered in the fridge. I think this is a really important step for this dish because all of the flavor that the chicken gets otherwise is just from cooking in the curry liquid and it doesn't cook that long. So it doesn't pick up a ton of flavor on its own. So I find that if you don't salt it beforehand, the interior of the chicken comes out really kind of bland. So I think the salting helps here a lot. 
as far as your choice of veggies goes here uh, you can do basically whatever you want I think these are pretty traditional options here but you can really if you don't like bell peppers or bamboo shoots you can mix and match really whatever veggies you want here the only thing I would argue is important is that you slice whatever veggies you have up pretty thin so that they cook in the liquid in a reasonable amount of time so once I get the veggies prepped all I have to do is julienne the bell pepper the bamboo shoots are ready to go I just got to dump them in I'm going to dump about half my can of coconut milk into my Dutch oven to start reducing. This step kind of intensifies the coconut flavor. It makes the whole thing a little bit richer and a little bit more fatty, which with so many like crazy assertive flavors, the added richness that this step provides really helps balance things out, I find. And while that gets going, I'm going to chop up the chicken. I want to get this into pretty small chunks because I want it to cook really fast. So I'd say about one inch chunks, somewhere around there is a good size. As far as your choice of coconut milk goes here, just make sure you use something that's full fat. I will say though, you can kind of see there this kind of grainy texture that mine has, which never really went away in the end, which didn't really affect the flavor so much, but it did affect the appearance in a way that I didn't love. So maybe don't use the same brand that I'm using, but just make sure it's full fat. So once that reduces and gets thick and I can see some of the oil kind of separating out of it, I'm gonna add all of my curry paste. I think this might be more curry paste than most recipes would call for, but I've been doing it with all of the curry paste that I make in this quantity and it tastes good, so I'm gonna keep doing it. So once I get the curry paste mixed in, I'm gonna add my chicken and make sure everything gets nice and coated. And then once all that's combined, I'm gonna add the rest of my coconut milk and then about one cup of chicken stock. This one's unsalted because I find it much easier to cook with unsalted chicken stock, especially if something's gonna cook a long time and it might reduce a little bit. And then I'm gonna add a few lime leaves that I'm just gonna tear into big chunks. So now, once that comes up to a simmer, I'm gonna turn it all the way down to low and throw the lid on and let that simmer for probably 20 to 25 minutes or until the pieces of chicken are fork tender. In the meanwhile, now's a good time to get some rice started. So I got some jasmine rice here and the ratio I like to use in terms of water is one cup of jasmine rice to about one and a third cups of water. So this is about 25 minutes later and to check for doneness, you can just pull a piece of chicken out and if you can smash it on the side of the pot with your spatula, kind of like that, you're probably good to go. So now I'm gonna add my bamboo shoots and crank the heat back up so those get a chance to cook. You could also add your red peppers here if you want to, but I kinda like to keep those pretty crispy in the end, so I'm gonna add them a little later. Now is also a good time to check the seasoning, so give it a taste and see if it needs more salt. Mine did, and I also wanted a little bit more fish sauce, so I added some of that too. So at this point, I'm gonna take the lime leaves out. You definitely don't have to do this, but I think they've given up enough of their flavor and aroma at this point, and they're kind of like bay leaves. They're not really something you wanna chew on, so I just get rid of them. So once this simmers for a couple minutes with the bamboo shoots in, I'm gonna go ahead and add the red pepper and then turn that down to low and just give those a brief minute to get tender. So after those get a couple minutes, the very last step is I'm gonna turn the heat off and I'm gonna throw in the rest of my Thai basil leaves. Those don't really need any time to cook on the heat at all. Just stir them in and the residual heat will take care of them. And that's it for the curry. So I'm gonna get some of my jasmine rice there. I like a lot of it and uh, get that in a big scoop in the middle of my bowl. And then I'm gonna get a couple big ladlefuls of my curry. I realized afterwards that if you want the rice to stay nice and pristine and white make it look a little better you should add the curry first and then put a scoop of rice on top of it afterwards but I didn't think that through so mine looks a little muddy but you know it's fine it will still taste great I like to garnish with a little bit of torn cilantro in the end and then I like a squeeze of lime on mine 
and that's how I do a green coconut curry. It takes a little bit of effort, a little bit of elbow grease, but it's totally worth it. It's not hard to put together, just takes a little time, and you're rewarded with one of the most delicious things that you could possibly eat. Not many foods have more flavor than this one. It's really incredible how good this stuff is. So I hope you try this one for yourself sometime. If you do, let me know in the comments how you liked it. Thanks. Bye.